appreciate the uh, great job you did with your communion thought and idea of abundant life. I also appreciate um, that you describe the locals as villagers in this uh, service. And first service, I had to say after to explain what the village people were doing on the island of Malta. So... <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you guys saw this uh, in the Huntsville Times. Uh, got a great write-up on Christina Buda and uh, her trials and also her faith that she lives out day by day and mentions the Twickenham Church of Christ. And I was talking with Christina beforehand, and she was saying that one of her neighbors came over and said, I wonder where you went to church because I know that you have a tremendous support group and I know your church takes care of you. So what a testimony. Uh, so we're really excited about that. I got on this morning to the Liz Hurley site. Uh, for those of you who don't know, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to have the big fun run for breast cancer research and awareness. And we have 131 on our team, which I believe is more than last year. So that's fantastic. So uh, we're really excited about that and appreciate you allowing us to go through this journey with you. And so we wanted to say a prayer, a special prayer of blessing for you. I'm going to invite Lee Potts to come up and offer a, a prayer uh, for you and, and your struggles, but, but also for these efforts as well. Lee? I, I spoke with um, Donald and Christina last night and again this morning. Um, and I, I think one of the things that, that Christine and Donald would like to do um, is just spend some time this morning um, to thank the congregation here. Um, Galate, uh, Paul is going to talk to the Galatian Christians, and he's going to tell them to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Um, and be it through a meal, caring for kids, or going on a 5K. For the last almost two years now, this church has fulfilled the law of Christ in the life of Christina and Donald as we walk what is oftentimes a dark and difficult path. Uh, and so she has asked that we um, share a passage of scripture with you from Psalm 55 uh, and then share a prayer together and we are happy to do that. Psalm 55 says, As for me, I shall call upon God and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon I will complain and murmur and he will hear my voice. He will redeem my soul in peace from the battle which is against me. For they are many who strive with me. God will hear and answer them. Let's pray. Father, indeed, in this, in this life, there is much heartbreak and sorrow. There is much that is thrust upon us that we do not want. And oftentimes, as we measure out a life with a husband and a wife and, uh, and small children and deal with the reality of a cancer that is gripping and weakening our bodies, we don't know where to turn. And so, Father, I... I now I lift up Christina and Donald to you. I, I lift them up in hopes of healing, but as, even as Christina mentions in the article, that, God, we pray for healing and know you can heal, but if you don't, we give you praise as well. For, Lord, you are, you are sovereign in all things, and we believe that. We believe that Romans 8, 28, when it says God works all things together for the good of those who love him, for those who are called according to his purpose— God, we believe you really did mean all. And we don't know how it works out. We, we don't fully understand how the thorn in Paul's flesh, how the struggles that he endured worked for his good, but we know they did. And we don't fully understand how this cancer works for Christina's good, but we know in your mercy and your grace it does. And so we lift up Christina and Donald. We give thanks for the family here that has loved them so well. And and we share this time, too, Father, to lift up Cheryl Jordan, who's, who's walking a similar path, and to one of the great joys and mercies in life is to see the church just be the church and bear the burdens of those who are suffering. And, Father, I thank you for that spiritually single class that has wrapped Cheryl Jordan in love. 
thank you for the men and women of this church who have wrapped the Buddhas in love. And most of all, Father, we thank you for the God of Romans 8.28 who we know will work all things for our good. And it is in the name of your beautiful son we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lee. We're in our third week of a series entitled With Ever-Increasing Glory, talking about the journey, the journey that each of us are intended to go on that doesn't end when we go into the waters of baptistry, but just begins. This is ever-increasing glory, the transformation that God promises that each of us will go through if we put our hope and trust in Him, this abundant life that Rob had mentioned during his communion thought. It's an intimate relationship that can only happen through being in his presence. Well, I mentioned last week that I've had the opportunity to go on uh, many uh, mountain climbing trips and to climb several of the tallest peaks in Colorado. And a lot of this was done primarily through uh, taking teen groups through a program called Wilderness Trek, which is a Christ-centered backpacking outfitter group based out of Salida, Colorado. And so for a little over a week, a group will, will go up there and go through a lot of different things that are designed to, to tear you down physically, but also to unite you, but also to build you up in Christ. And, and for each member, some of the days are more difficult than others. Uh, for some, it's, it's day two when you go repelling, and sometimes it's a 60-foot cliff. Sometimes they have one that, that's almost 200 feet. And so to go over the edge and you lean back, it just puts people, oh, I can't believe I'm going through this. For others, the, the toughest day is the second to last. You make your attempt on summit. And so you're up there, and you're, you're up above the, the tree line where the air is thin and, and oxygen is, is diminished, and it's a little scary doing the climbing. And so, so summit day for them is, is definitely the, the pinnacle, the most difficult part of the journey. For me, it was always day three, because day three is when they get you to load up your entire pack. You take everything from base camp, you load it in, and you start making your way up to high camp. Now, depending on the mountain that you're climbing, this may be a four to five hour journey. Sometimes it's, it's a seven to eight hour journey up there, and you're loaded down with your full pack. In my, my first year, we climbed a mountain called Clinton Peak, which is elevation 13,857. So it doesn't qualify as one of the 14ers, but it's pretty steep and difficult. And with my whole pack on, well, I was just huffing and puffing to get up the mountain, and I was struggling. But being the, the youth minister and the leader of, of, of the group, I didn't want to let the teens know how much I was struggling. So I toughed it out and made it, but I definitely was not having fun. Well, one of the traditions on Wilderness Trek is when you get about a quarter of a mile from your high camp, uh, the guide will pull over and ask everyone to take off their backpack. And so you put it in front of you. So he talks about the burdens that we carry and the things that we have to go around in life with and some of the things that, that are good and some of the, the bad burdens that we have. But he said, as Christians, we're, we're supposed to share the load with each other. And so we're supposed to carry each other's burdens. So he said, it's not just metaphorically. Today, we won't actually do it. And so he asked you to put the hand on, on the pack next to you and then scoot over and take that. And so for the last quarter mile, you carry the pack of the person next to you. Well, it just so happens that I was standing next to our guide, which is a guy named Paul Castleman, who was a college student at the time at Abilene Christian. And so Paul takes my pack and he straps it on. And he said, well, this is the first for me. He said, usually my pack is the heaviest because I have to carry the rappel rope and I have to carry a first aid kit and some other things as guide. But he said, yours feels heavier. What do you have in there? And I said, well, Paul, you, you gave me the heaviest meal, which was the big Spam canisters, you know. And so we had Spam and Vienna sausage and stuff, and he gave that to me. And I said, you also gave me all the fuel for the Coleman stoves. He goes, well, but your pack still shouldn't be that heavy. When we get to camp, I want to see what you've packed in this thing. I was like, okay. And so we go, and we start setting up tents. And I was hoping Paul would kind of forget about it. He goes, no, I open it up. I want to see what's in there. So I started pulling out some stuff. And the first thing you know is he goes, you have two pairs of blue jeans? He said, blue jeans are the last thing you want to take on. A, he goes, if they get wet, they're, I said, but they're comfortable and they're warm. He goes, yeah, but that, they're too heavy. You don't need to take that. What else you got in there? Well, I had two hooded sweatshirts to keep warm. He goes, once again, if they get wet, they're toast. It's not what you need up here. So then he pulls out an extra pair of hiking boots. He goes, but two pairs of hiking boots? Well, yeah, well, what happens if these wear out or get wet? He goes, then you put on sandals. 
So he goes, I can't believe this. So he started going through, and he said, you have a towel and washcloth. I said, well, Jill said I need to bathe while I was up there. He goes, the, the stream is 50 degrees, like you're going to hop in that. That's worthless. You don't need that. And then he saw a full tube of toothpaste, a full bottle of insect repellent, and a full bottle of sunscreen. I said, well, high elevation. He goes, yeah, take the little travel one. You don't need all this stuff. And then he got to the back pouch, which was all my snacks. He goes, do you think we're not going to have food? And among them was a full bag of peanut and M&Ms. He's like, I can't. Now I understand why this thing weighs so much. When we got down to base camp, after everything was said and done, he said, bring your pack over here. And so they were loading up the supplies for the next group to be coming in. So he put some full, a full thing of fuel in there, also the Vienna sausage and, and Spam meal. He put it back in my pack. He goes, let's go weigh this thing, 110 pounds. Well, when I got home, Jill said, did you miss me? I said, well, I feel like I gave you a piggyback ride all the way up. So <laughs> sometimes our packs get a little heavy. But is it possible that we carry around way too much stuff with us? Is there some things that we need to unload before we head out on our journey to make the descent to be with the Father? Well, certainly, we see this idea played out in Mark chapter 6. The first time he sends out his disciples, he goes, I want you guys to go out two by two. Okay, so they start packing stuff to go on this trip. He goes, no, 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 leave your bag. Okay, well, if we don't take a bag, do we just carry our food? He goes, no, leave your bread here too. Okay, so we'll buy stuff when we get there. No, leave your money here as well. Just take a staff. And so they're going, okay, I guess we'll carry our clothes. He goes, no, leave your clothes as well. Don't take an extra tunic. So just go with a shirt on your back and a staff. Why? I want you to be dependent upon me. I want you to see I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to take care of you. And God's people are going to be my instrument to help you. And if they're not going to help you, move on to the next town. But I want you to get used to relying upon me, not upon what your provisions are for yourself. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Luke chapter 18. And we're going to start reading in verse 18. I, this is not an easy concept for us, especially here in America. We like to take care of our own stuff. But I easily could have, I, I entitled this lesson, um, Lightning the Low. But in, in reality, I could have called it The Tale of Two Rich Guys. But turn with me to Luke chapter 18. We're going to start reading in verse 18. So Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 18. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, No one is good except God alone. Well, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. Oh, all these things I've kept since I was a young boy. When Jesus heard this. He said to him, we still lack one thing. Go sell all your possessions and give to the poor. Then you'll have treasure in heaven. Then follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Well, let's, let's talk about this for a moment. So we have the rich ruler here. What exactly did he have? Well, a lot of things. That's correct. So if he's a ruler, obviously he's used to saying things and it gets done. He's not used to being told no. He's a very powerful person. So he has power that's uh, instilled within and embedded within his position. He's a very powerful man also said that he was a wealthy ruler. Now, we don't know how much cash he had or what degree of wealth, but obviously money was not a problem. It wasn't an issue for this man. So we have this rich ruler who, who's powerful, he's wealthy. But he also says he's a good guy. Since he was yay high to a grasshopper, I mean, he has followed the commands. He's been taught what's right and what's wrong. And when given the opportunity, he's chosen the right path. So isn't that great? And in fact, you'd look at his life, you would say, this guy has it. This guy has things under control. Okay? Not a bad thing. Well, he comes in contact with who? He comes in contact with Jesus. And so he comes up to him and says, 
okay, you kind of, I'm laying my life out for you. What's going on here? Is there anything I'm lacking? What I need for eternal life? So Jesus comes and talks with him. He says, you know what? He said, uh, I can see that you do your best to live according to the law. I know you're good and you're an upstanding citizen. And I'm sure everyone admires you. He said, there's still something lacking. He said, I want, I want your treasure. I want you to move your treasure over to here. Because with your treasure comes your heart. And in a lot of ways, I can tell that you're good, but your heart is not with me. Your heart's not completely given over to the Lord. Well, it's kind of a difficult teaching for him to understand. He says, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then you can come follow me. Okay, well, is there anything wrong with being powerful? Is there anything wrong with being wealthy or being under control? Absolutely not. But the Lord says there's still something lacking. He says, I want you to value me. I want you to understand my kingdom. I want you to understand everything I have to offer. Because this is kind of a hard deal, but he says, if you understand who I am, you understand what I'm offering you, guess what? These things pale in comparison. So it's no big deal what I'm asking you to do, even though it is, by the world's standards, something very hard for us to understand and to do. In 2003, the rock group No Doubt released a cover uh, to an old Talk Talk song from the 80s, and the song's entitled It's My Life. And the song centers around uh, the, the subject who, who has fallen in head over heels with someone. And this person has to decide the level of commitment that they're willing to show in this relationship. This is a person I've been waiting for all my life, and I've fallen for them. I love this person, but now I've got to figure out how much am I going to commit myself because I'm, I'm going to hold on to this love. And in fact, the, the person even says, halfway just won't do. Around the edge of making a full commitment to this person, they're completely pledging themselves to this newfound love. The person in the song comes to their senses, takes a step back and boldly proclaims, hold on, it's my life, don't you forget, it's my life, it never ends. And I, I wonder sometimes if God sees that with us, for us to say, okay, I, I see Jesus and I understand this, but it's my life. Can't I just sprinkle in some of the commandments and be better and be moral and do a better job than the people across the street? And say, okay, well, that, look at the lifestyle they're living. Look at the lifestyle I'm living. Isn't that so much better? The reality, Jesus says, it's not enough. I want your heart. I want you to be totally sold out on me. But sometimes we, we, we take a step there, but then we pull back and say, no, it's my life. I'm not ready to give that up. When he came down to it, the cost was just too high for the rich ruler. He chose to hold firm to his life to hold firm, to hold fast, to remain pat, to, to play it safe, to still remain in control. I don't want to just launch out there and not know exactly what's going to happen. I've got, this works for me. I understand this. Can I remain in control? Is it fair for Jesus to ask him to give up everything to follow him? I think the Messiah would tell you, not only is it fair, you can't follow after me if you're trying to keep this world going. If, if this is the life you're protecting, guess what? You're not going to be able to come after me. It's not that I'm being unfair. It's just you can't pursue both equally. We, we try. And, and I'm sure the rich ruler goes, man, I, I wish I could have this life and just kind of sprinkle a little Jesus in here, Okay. And, and just say, boy, I still want my power and, and my wealth and, and have things into control and, and to have my treasure, but I just want to mix a little Jesus in. And the Lord says that just doesn't work. Well, who? So, but what's interesting is, is the rich ruler has all this, but yet he still feels like something's missing. What, why else would he come to Jesus and ask this question if there wasn't something inside of him saying, it, it's just not working the way I'm doing things? Yet he comes to the doctor for the cure. He just didn't like the prescription. Well, who's the second person? Turn over one chapter to Luke chapter 19. 
Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. Being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed up in a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and began to mutter, He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, look, Lord, Lord, hold on. Here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'm going to pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. Can you imagine? Well, let's look at this. Okay, so we've kind of gotten over this. What if we kind of add in a new name? Okay. We're just going to call him Zach. I know it's with two C's. But, uh, so we have Zach. What, what does Zach have? Well, um, it says that he's very wealthy. Okay, so that's similar to the to rich ruler. So if you think about it, um, he made a living rounding up the tariffs that were required by the Romans, and then he charges extra So the, from his fellow countrymen. And I'm sure they didn't appreciate him. They kind of viewed him, I'm sure, as a capitalist, as a collaborator, and as a crook. Not only was he rich and wealthy, but he did it in a lot of ways from extorting from the occup- on behalf of the occupying Romans. I'm sure if there were young people of the day that were camped out there and, and you know, down the downtown area in the streets of Jericho and they got their beanie hats on and they're, they're protesting economic inequality and they're not showering and they're, they're all kind of hunkered down there in Jericho, guess what? Zacchaeus would be the poster child of the grievances. He's what's wrong with the system. He's the one we should be looking at. And definitely he was a man of means. Well, it says he's also the chief of the tax collectors. So obviously, he's got some power. He's got some influence. He's, he's probably on the Chamber of Commerce. I mean, he is definitely a man that's in a powerful position. And by the world's standards, he's got the tiger by the tail. He's in control of his situation. So in a lot of ways, he's just like the rich ruler. And yet, Luke shares that the vertically challenged man says he wants to go get a look and see about this Jesus. Why? It's the same as the rich ruler. He had all of this, but yet there's a hole. As Robin talked about, the God-shaped hole in your life wasn't being filled. And so he had all of this, but yet he found himself wanting, wanting to see who Jesus knows. Little does he know this encounter with him is going to change his life as the Messiah invites himself over to his house. And don't you know if you're there in the town, you're like, of all the people that he could have asked to dine with and to show acceptance towards, why in the world would Jesus pick the short guy up in the tree that everyone hated? Well, for whatever reason, the people start murmuring. They start talking. They start complaining. Why would he pick Zacchaeus? Well, whether his response was immediate or I think it was later on, they go over to Zacchaeus' house and they're having dinner. And they're still hearing this murmuring out in the streets. Maybe some of the guests that were there starts talking about him. And so he says, hold on, let's settle this. So it says he stands up. His response at the dinner table, he says, I'm responding to Jesus' initiative and generously promises to share his resources, even to the point of making restitution. If there's anything he's done wrong, to those paying the highest penalty of the law. He could have just done what he cheated him out plus like 10%, but said he goes, no, I want to do four times, four times what I've cheated you. So in a moment's time, guess what happens? His wealth, his overall portfolio, half of it's gone. And guess what? Depending on how he's been doing his business, well, there's probably a long line of folks, and so his money is flying out of his checking account. But for Zacchaeus, what's happening within here has to come out in his generosity and what, what he's doing and manifests itself in this way. 
So when he adds up everything he has, his wealth, his power, and his control, he says, it doesn't add up to what I see in Jesus, what I hear, what I've been missing and longing for all my life. He said, this is what I want, even if it costs me all of this. And how does Jesus respond? I imagine Jesus is laughing. I imagine he's chuckling, and he's just got this big barrel laugh. <laughs> Salvation has come to you and your household. You get it? You finally have turned your back on what the world says is important, and you've given your treasure over. You said, this is what I want. I've made my choice. Oh, what a celebration that took place that night. As we see what's happening within Zacchaeus' heart, by faith, he becomes the rich man that makes it through the eye of the needle by God's hand. That's a celebration, boy, a victory that God gives. In 1845, the ill-fated Franklin expedition sailed from England to find passage through the Arctic Ocean. And led by Captain Sir John Franklin, a, a, a Royal Navy officer, uh, and his experienced explorer, and he leads out the two ships of the expedition, and they become icebound in the Victorian Strait up in the Canadian Arctic, unable to move. And so they become, if you guys have seen some of the TV shows where they're fishing up north, they're, they're locked in there, and ice starts forming around the ship, and they can't move. Eventually, Franklin and 128 of his members of his crew, everyone, perished before reaching their destination. But what went wrong on the Franklin expedition? Well, long before they got themselves in this situation, upon Franklin's orders, back in England, the crew loaded a whole bunch of stuff on these two ships that never should have been on there. They really had no value, things they didn't need. Stuff like a full house worth of handcrafted furniture, a 1,200-volume library, several sets of fine china, crystal goblets and sterling silverware for each of the officers with their monogrammed initials on, uh, on each of the utensils of the handles. Well, how did they make room for all this extra stuff that they brought? He had done this, this trip three times, but this fourth time he brings all this. How did they make room? Well, they only loaded half the supply of coal needed to power the auxiliary steam engines. So when they get in this time of crisis, they, they simply ran out of steam. They ran out of coal, no way to power through the ice. Well, apparently after Franklin died, two of his officers decided to, hey, I'm, we're going to leave the crew and go out on our own. And said that, that they, they loaded up um, a large sled, and they made it more than 65 miles. They almost made it to safety when they died on the treacherous ice. And when the rescuers found their body, they discovered that the sled was filled with all these, uh, with the table limbs and uh, the table silver and the goblets and all these valuable things. Certainly these men contributed to their own demise by, by carrying what they didn't need with them. My, my prayer for us, folks, is that we don't make the same mistake. I, I pray that we'll take a look at, life is so short, it's passing by so quickly. I hope we'll realize what we've got. And Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Come with me, trust me, leave all that stuff behind. Run with perseverance. And so as we begin thinking about some of these things, and next week we'll start climbing, I promise. We built base camp and we've gotten here with our pack. It's time for us to start climbing. But I want us to realize what God is calling us to. The Lord desperately wants our treasure. And, and for some this morning, it may be like the rich ruler or Zacchaeus, that the treasure is, is finances, it's, it's, it's financial things, it's our job, it's our security that comes from that. For others, your, your treasure is your family, it's your children. And, and there's nothing wrong with, with loving your family and, and your friends and your children. But guess what? That can't be your treasure. Jesus says, when it comes to talking about your parents, when it comes to talking about your children, People ought to look at your life and say, compare with Jesus, you hate your kids. Well, that's harsh. But Jesus says, it's not going to work just adding a little bit of me into this life. You've got to sacrifice that life in order to find abundance 
to find the life that God's calling us to, to make him our treasure. One more kernel of truth that I think is fantastic in the story of Zacchaeus. The text tells us Jesus was passing through. He never intended to spend the day with the tax collector, chief of the tax collector there in Jericho. My feelings are is that the Lord opened his eyes, opened his eyes to an open heart. What does verse 10 say? It says, that's what the Son of Man is here to do, to seek and to save those that are lost. He's looking for open hearts. Yes, we're to get rid of our burdens and we're to seek after him, but we have to know God is there before us. He's been there all along. Uh, Lord, I stand at the door and knock. I'm here. I'm ready to go. I'm pursuing you. And God is looking for open hearts. The Lord is seeking after us. This morning, you got anything in your pack that's loading you down, that's keeping you from the life? We've been talking about this abundant life. You know, unless you unload it, you're simply not going to make it to the destination that the Lord has in store for you. And this morning, if you want to come talk with the staff and with shepherds, we'll be available. Please come talk with us. We'd love to help you unpack some things that will lighten your load so you can move forward in your faith walk with Jesus. But I pray that we as a congregation, that we will truly let people know the Lord is our treasure. That's the thing that we want. That's the thing we want for our families is to have eternal life in Jesus Christ. Because when we declare that and we start living it, guess what? The Lord says, you're ready. I can start transforming you with ever-increasing glory. Lincoln.